Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's systems lunch um, online for the whole world. Um, so um, I'm happy to be able to have uh, as our second um, UMass systems lunch speaker of the series, Hila Peleg. Um, so Hila is so Hila is a postdoc at the CSE in the CSE department at UC San Diego. Um, uh, her uh, postdoc advisor is Nadia Polikarpova. Uh, she received her PhD at the Technion in Israel, uh, and she also holds a degree in literature, like so many computer scientists. Um, so, uh, so Hila's research explores how program synthesis can be transformed into tools not for um, Excel users. Um, who are super important, of course, um, but also for developers who are, uh, I don't know, we, we all love developers. So um, so with that, I will let Gila take it away. Oh, uh, can you let me share, though? Oh, geez, you, you, you want to share your screen, huh? OK, I guess that would be. I, mean, cool. I can just talk, but. <laughs> just, you know, hand wave. All right, great. Should be set now. We good? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, and I basically want to start off by uh, talking about how we think about coding because we're we're used to thinking about any kind of programming as something that's going to require some measure of elbow grease and, and sweat and, and possibly tears. And while some of that is ultimately always going to be true, no matter what the future of software looks like, uh, one of the advances that PL and software engineering research tries to offer the world is to take away some of the elbow grease and to make sure that the person that's writing the code can focus on the creative aspect of programming and not worry too much about the small, boring, annoying things. And there's a lot of ways that we try to do this. And the one that I work on, um, like uh, Emery said in his introduction, is building developer tools that generate or uh, suggest code to the programmer. And this is supposed to speed up coding tasks, make sure that the programmer doesn't need to commit too much to memory, uh, but on the other hand, doesn't have to stop everything that they're doing to go look for things that they don't remember at any given moment. And hopefully this is going to take as much of the busy work as possible out of writing code and leave programmers free to think about the higher level things or how the new and unique bits uh, in the code that they're writing uh, should go instead of worrying about, you know, pointers or little list algorithms that uh, they don't want to bother remembering. And the way that we do this, or at least the way that I do this, uh, is with something called program synthesis. So program synthesis is the process of taking a description that can't be one-to-one -one translated to code, or in other words, it can't be compiled uh, and applying some magic to try to turn it to code anyways. And there's two elements to the way that we do this. One is what this magic actually is. And the other is how do we tell it what we want to have happen, uh, which is how we specify to the synthesizer what is our intent. Uh, there's a lot of customary um, flavors of specification to synthesizers. Um, there's some work on natural language specifications, uh, for instance, but more often than not, it's going to be one of several more formal ways uh, to express intent. So for instance, it might be the type signature of the function that uh, you're looking for, uh, because in all sorts of situations, types can actually be really expressive ways to explain uh, what it is that you want or where you're coming from and where you're going to go. Uh, it could be a structural request for what the code might be like or what the code definitely is. Um, and it can be a logical description of the program, either a full logical description that describes every possible behavior or a partial description that 
describes just some of the behaviors of the program. And a lot of the times it's going to be examples of uh, certain desired behaviors, uh, specific inputs and uh, what their outputs or what their side effects are going to be. Uh, and then the other element is uh, how do we perform this magic? And the answer to that is through search. The synthesizer is going to search for a program in a very large search space of a lot of possible programs, check whether it's the one that the user wanted. And if it finds a program that satisfies what the user specified, and a lot of the time that's going to be a pretty big if, it returns that program to the user. And the truth is that it's not just one kind of search. Because synthesis is a very hard problem, and it's going to be uh, exponential on a good day, uh, this needs to uh, search a very, very big, uh, enormous space of programs. And so usually the search is going to be very specifically tailored both to the domain of programs that we want to be searching over and also to the kind of specifications that the user uh, can provide. And more often than not, what's going to happen is actually that this is going to work backwards. So someone has a really neat idea uh, for a kind of search that can be done. Uh, and in the course of building this search, uh, what they come up with is going to dictate what the user is going to have to tell the synthesizer in order to get the search going. So for instance, there's a mechanism called uh, version space algebra that's really, really useful uh, for describing sequence to sequence transformations. Um, so if you're going to search it, you need to give it a starting sequence and an end sequence. And so a lot of the synthesizers that you would see with it would say the only form of specification that we're going to accept is a string, which is a sequence uh, input to what string output it's going to go to. So only string to string examples. Likewise, um, it turns out that Petri nets are a very interesting way to work with type rich environments. So to, to graph the way types relate to other types within an API, for instance. Uh, but then also when uh, doing reachability over this kind of graph, you would still need to validate that the program is correct. So um, the synthesizer uh, that does this, which by the way is one of my personal favorite synthesis works, um, is going to ask the user for both a type specification and tests. And it asks for this in the way of a unit test uh, that tests the entire uh, query altogether. But then on the other hand, there's a lot of work that's being done to reimagine what the user's interaction with synthesis would or could look like. Uh, but sometimes this is done with no real regard for how synthesis would actually work. And it's actually easiest to show this with one of my own old works um, so as part of uh, my PhD uh, in Israel, we developed a way to augment specification by example uh, with more local forms of specification. Because examples basically tell you about the entire program, either the entire program satisfies this entire example or the entire program does not, it, it does nothing to tell uh, the synthesizer, what parts of the program are good or bad. So we came up with these specifications that are kind of code review like. Um, so it's kind of like giving the synthesizer uh, code review comments about the program that it's tried uh, to give you out of the search space. You would say, oh, um, this bit is good. Uh, so you should definitely keep that and have that in the program that you're going to give me eventually, and this bit is bad, so don't include that, and now go and find me another program. 
Um, and this whole idea leans on the fact that we're talking about programmers specifically. So we can ask them to do things like read code and they're familiar with code review as part of the development process. So this is uh, giving comments to someone who's given them code is a more natural part of their workflow. Uh, and then we also threw in a little bit of help for how to read the code um, so that they can make a more informed decision. But there was absolutely no thought to how this would work in an actual synthesizer. And the thing is, both of these approaches, either looking at just the synthesizer and the synthesizer dictates everything the user would have to do, uh, or looking at the user interaction and letting that dictate uh, synthesis entirely, or hoping that we can come up with a synthesizer that can do this, um, are not going to get us tools that actually help real developers that want uh, to write code and use the tool as part of their normal workflow. What we need is we need to build both parts of the tool, the synthesizer and how it's going to be used simultaneously, um, and always make sure that both of the elements that we have are always still in cooperation with each other. And we call this co-design. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna cover uh, three different tools that we built and show how synthesis can fit into a development workflow, but also the importance of co-design in making each one of these tools. And of these three examples, I'm gonna talk about the first one pretty briefly, uh, the second one in depth, and just barely mention the last one. So let's get started. Um, in this picture, uh, these are uh, called projection boxes, and they're a way to visualize the execution state of the program while writing it. Uh, and this is an interaction paradigm for development that's called live programming, where uh, the programmer can always see uh, the full execution state of the program as they're uh, coding it out. Uh, and each variable uh, that appears is, go is going to be added to the projection boxes uh, from, its, uh, uh, from the line that it's added and in all su subsequent projection boxes for all subsequent lines. Um, and so we have uh, words that has its value here. Um, abbreviate has its value in every line. And you can see here that uh, our function is called with two separate values, which means that uh, the variable, uh, the, the, the argument for the function, and so every subsequent uh, assigned variable is going to have uh, two values, one for each possible execution. And this will also be the case if, say, there's a loop in the code, we're going to expand out that loop and show the programmer all of the possible uh, executions of this loop. And projection boxes gives you a very good picture of what's going on in the code. But writing the next line of code is still your responsibility as the developer. On the other hand, we have programming by example, which is the name for the synthesis paradigm where we give the synthesizer input examples and the output for each one of those inputs. Um, and we can take our task and move it over to a programming by example synthesizer, uh, come up with inputs if we're inside a loop, uh, figure out what the uh, local variables are going to be, uh, what variables are important, give that to a synthesizer and copy the code back. But actually it seems like it would be a really good way to uh, uh, mesh the two together. We have Live programming gives us a lot of values uh, that are just ready to be inputs for the next line of code. So I'm going to show you um, what the combination of those two does with a little task, uh, which is to abbreviate uh, a name. And so the way that 
uh, we would want to do that uh, if we want to go from uh, Augusta Eta King to AAK. Uh, we kind of know that we want to split it into words. Uh, we want to take the first letter of each one of those words and we want to put dots between them. And we maybe don't necessarily know exactly how we want to do that um, in the language that we're aiming for, Python in this case. Um, but we kind of know what the algorithm that we're looking for, what the steps that we want to perform are. And so Snippy, which uh, does this inside of projection boxes, basically says, well, we have the inputs, which are the values of our variables. If we just edit the value of a variable we're assigning into, um, we're basically now providing an example to a pro programming by example synthesizer, which can go and synthesize what the expression being assigned should be, what the next line of code is. So we basically solve the problem that we know a lot about our state, but we still need to write the next line of a code ourselves because, well, we don't need to anymore. So these two seem to mesh together pretty well, right? Um, but I was talking about this whole principle of co-design. Um, and there's actually this one minor challenge that I find interesting. So this will get us ramped up into talking about co-design. Um, and that's what happens when we have loops. Because when we have loops, uh, we have a lot of values. And we don't necessarily want our user, which is a programmer, and programmers do tend to be quite lazy, to have to put in you know, 5 or 10 or 15 values for every uh, line in the projection box representing every iteration of the loop for every input. So we kind of get to this point where um, we want to spare them all of this. So we made a change to the synthesizer to support a change in the interaction where only things that the user has changed uh, are now examples. So the user doesn't have to uh, specify every single line, but, um, uh, and the synthesizer is going to ignore what hasn't been changed. That's no longer an example uh, to coming up with the next line of code. Uh, except I said before that search is quite a delicate little flower. Uh, and this had uh, an unexpected side effect. Now, what ended up happening? Well, some of the lines, uh, some of the outputs that were already there for the variables were actually already correct. But because we now said that we're only going to consider what has changed, we're now no longer giving them as good examples of correct behavior. And one of the things that uh, anyone who's tried to use any code generation um, or any synthesis may know is that any behavior that's not specified may and probably will be overridden uh, by some other solution. So if we now are no longer saying that these are correct, good examples, we're giving the synthesizer free range to give completely different values here. Yeah, so this is not very good. And actually, in, in the first iterations of the tool, got some of our users into trouble. So what we do is we change the interaction and we say, well, we're going to give the ability to say the value here is already good, which we call uh, re-specify. So in this example here, we have uh, two rows in the projection box where we say this output is already good, one where uh, we edited uh, the output to, to give an example that's completely new and then a bunch more rows that we don't have to worry about. Uh, and now Snippy can work with a wider range of good examples. So this was a pretty minor challenge where we had to, 
where we wanted to make a change to the interaction um, and so had to make a change to the synthesizer and then to the interaction some more. Uh, let's move on to my next example where it gets a little bit more massive. Uh, and this example I'm going to cover in depth and I'm going to start with an example task. So let's say we want to find uh, the median of an array. Um, and you know, we're, we're only going to uh, worry about um, odd numbers of elements at the moment, just because we're trying to do a, a simple variant. Um, so to do that, we're going to need to get the elements in order. And then uh, we're going to find the middle of the array. And we're going to get that element. And so the program that we're after, or the expression that we're after, and we are in uh, JavaScript now, is going to be more or less uh, this program. Now, let's see how a user would solve that uh, in a redevel print loop, in a REPL, which is where a lot of us do the little explorations for I just need this one expression that does this one thing. So uh, a user would initialize an environment variable um, to have some sample input, and then they would try out small expressions. Uh, and uh, as things work, you make the expressions more complex. And when things don't work, you try to guess what went wrong. Uh, you zoom in to fix that. Sometimes you go off to the browser uh, and try to find out what are the bits that you don't know come back uh, and try to add them in as part of the expression. And once it works, you start growing your expression again. So we have a REPL on uh, one side. And, and REPLs are inherently an iterative process. Um, and then on the other side, we have this previous work idea that I showed you before, uh, the one that has the code review-like comments um, that are meant to iterate on code that the synthesizer returns. So we have two iterative processes. Will they go together? So we want to take a synthesizer and, and uh, in a REPL environment and, and put these uh, exclude and retain um, forms of feedback to the synthesizer on it and, and see what happens. And so here is the same task being solved in a read eval synth loop or wrestle. Um, see, why is my video not playing? There we go. So the user would add um, inputs to the environment, and this can be more than one input as part of adding examples. Um, and then they can also uh, write code. They can zoom into parts of it saying that this is the bit I'm trying to fix now. Uh, and they can tell the synthesizer things like retain or exclude this bit and send the synthesizer uh, to fix it. Now, in getting this to work, or in order to uh, get the two elements of it together, we had to tackle three pretty big challenges. And let me start going through them. The first one, right out of the gate, is we don't have a working synthesizer for this interaction idea. Because the previous work that was done had no synthesizer, had no working uh, synthesis backend. And actually, it turns out that if you take this specification of I want this example and also to retain this element of the code, uh, input dot length divided by two, which is where I expect the median to be, um, or at least once I put floor over it, I expect uh, that's where I expect the median to be. Um, if I put those two in the specification together and I send the synthesizer off to work, I'm going to get no program as my result after it's thought about it for some time and my timeout has lapsed. And that's a little confusing because 
in theory, I have all of the elements for this program in my uh, space of programs. This program should be there. Why would this happen? So to explain why, I first need to give you a little taste of how synthesis actually works uh, deep down. Uh, one of the ways that we search for programs uh, is by enumerating the programs in the space from a grammar that contains the operations and the functions that define the space. Uh, and then for each program, we check it, we see if it fits our specification, and if it doesn't, we move on uh, to enumerating the next program. Uh, so let's take this little toy grammar here that can only add and multiply uh, a very few things uh, and do what is called a height-based enumeration on it. So first we're gonna enumerate programs whose abstract syntax tree has a height of zero. So these are programs that we get by uh, one production. So uh, only uh, these. So we would enumerate zero and one and X. Um, and then we move on to start making bigger programs out of the smaller programs that we've already seen. So uh, if we move on to this production rule, which is um, an expression is uh, an expression plus an expression, uh, then using the smaller programs, we can now create zero plus zero and zero plus one and zero plus X and one plus zero and one plus one and one plus X and x plus zero, x plus one, x plus x. And then we move on to multiplication and we do the same thing all over again. And then after we've done that, these are the programs uh, of height one. Uh, we start over to do this for height two and height two is going to use all of the programs of height zero or one to try to make uh, new programs. So, um, and this is what an exponential blow up looks like. You know, we're, we're barely out of the gate. We're already swimming in candidate programs. And in fact, height two of this grammar has <clears throat> 200 odd programs. Height three has 18,000 programs. And that's just for this little toy grammar that can only add and multiply. Uh, imagine what would happen if we had uh, more operations, more variables, uh, more terminals, so more uh, constants and literals. But there's two things that, it's, that are important to notice here. One is that a lot of these programs are actually redundant, and some of them are you know, very blatantly redundant. Um, the other thing is that the more programs that there are at the lower heights, the more and more programs that we're going to have in the later stages of the enumeration, just because we're trying to build on programs that we, we've already seen. And if we see fewer programs, we're going to try to build fewer big programs. And so if we happen to be in a world where our specification is by example, we can take advantage of the fact that we have inputs, actual inputs that the user cares about, uh, and we can use them and run things. So let's take two inputs from some two examples um, and execute all of our programs, uh, evaluate all of our programs. So the blue vectors here are going to be um, uh, first evaluating on uh, I0 and then evaluating on I1 that are here on the right. And this gives us the observed behavior um, on these inputs and just on these inputs and not on, on anything else. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to divide the space into equivalence classes based only on this observed behavior. So for instance, uh, here are all the programs, uh, oh, there's more of them, but all the ones that fit on the screen that give us zero for the first input and then also zero for the second input. 
And now what we can do is we can throw away all except one, for instance, the first one, and that's gonna remove a lot of programs from our space. And then we do this again for one and one, and only keep one of them. Um, and because one of the ways that we search for programs, uh, I'm sorry, because the way that, that we search for programs is enumerate, the fact that we have fewer programs now means that later we're going to make uh, less big programs. So the gains of chucking all of these programs that we've just chucked are multiplied. Um, and we've also kind of lazily bypassed the fact that it's really, really hard to do equivalence by saying we're only going to do equivalence on the inputs that we care about. And this is called observational equivalence. And it's one of the state of the art search optimizations uh, in program synthesis. So now that I've shown you this, let get, let's get back to our specification that breaks. Um, the program that we want uses input dot length divided by two. And so in order to uh, have that, we also need to build input dot length. So ideally, our enumeration is going to look something like this. Somewhere in height one, we have input dot length that on our example um, is uh, evaluates to three. And then later at height two, we're going to use that to build input dot length divided by two. Uh, and then hopefully from that later build uh, the full program. But what might happen is this. What if we see another program, say two plus one, that also evaluates to three? And what if we see it first? Because one of the things that we usually do for engineering reasons is that when we're picking the representative of our equivalence class, we're going to hold on to the program that we saw first that gives us this set of values that represents the equivalence class. So what's going to happen if we see two plus one before we see input dot length is that we're going to get rid of input dot length. And once we got rid of input dot length, that means that we're also never going to construct input dot length divided by two because we no longer have the smaller program from which to make the larger program. And that means that retain of input dot length divided by two is never ever going to be satisfied in this enumeration anymore uh, because we're never going to build a program that uses it. So we've lost our ability to satisfy the specification that the user has asked for. This is, you know, not great. So what we do in order to solve this is we generalize the way synthesis works. If observational equivalence over examples basically said that two programs are equivalent, if for every example, the evaluation uh, uh, of the program on each of the inputs comes out to the same output, and this was a problem because we only considered examples in order to do this, there's parts of the specification that we didn't consider at all, like retain. What we're going to do now is we're going to say there is a thing that is called an observer. And an observer gives us, um, relates to a specific part of the specification and tells us something about it, um, about a program. And if the values of the observer for two programs are the same for every bit of the specification, those programs are going to be equivalent. And I'm purposefully being a little vague here because observers tend to be kind of different from each other. But for instance, for examples, it's still going to be the execution result. So if our specification is entirely examples, our enumeration is going to behave just the way it did before. But what's going to happen uh, when we go back to 
um, our broken enumeration from before. Well, we're going to uh, give an observer value that has something to do with retain. And in this case, we're going to mark down um, in the observational equivalence uh, in the observer for retain, whether an expression is going to be important for satisfying retain. Because if it is, we really want to keep it even if it's equivalent by values to something else. So two plus one evaluates the three on the input from the example, but it's not in any way a part of this retain input dot length divided by two that we're trying to satisfy. In, input dot length evaluates the three on the, uh, on the input. And also it's part of the retained expression. And actually what we're going to do is not just note that it's part of the retained expression, but specifically which part. And then when we build input dot length divided by two, which we're now going to construct because we didn't get rid of input dot length because two plus one and input dot length are now no longer equivalent. We're actually not going to say that it's part of the thing we're trying to retain. It already has the thing we're trying to retain. And that means that, for instance, if we take this whole thing and multiply it by one, those two are now really equivalent because both evaluate to uh, 1.5 and have this retained expression in them. So we're making sure that we're looking at the entire specification and we're not throwing anything important as we're constructing programs. Now, the byproduct of this, uh, because we didn't just uh, go in and handle retain and exclude, we went and made a general framework, is that you can actually support way, way more things that you could specify to the synthesizer now. Um, so we could theoretically uh, go back to the interaction and add eight or nine more things that you can tell the synthesizer. But that's just um, overloading the user with information. So we actually pick two things, um, which is the ability to tell the user that, or the, the ability to tell the synthesizer that uh, the resulting program should have some sub-expression that's of a type number or Boolean or string and should definitely not have any sub-expression uh, of this type, uh, which is something that uh, users rather like, especially in a language like JavaScript where this is not as simple a thing as it is in a strongly typed language. Now, now that we've done that, uh, we move on to the next thing that we need to get this to work in a more um, usable tool-like manner. And the next thing that we have to tackle is what happens when we want to synthesize loops. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about uh, functions that loop, like filter and map and group by, uh, but everything I'm saying actually is also true for normal loops. Uh, but if we look at a function like filter, uh, it takes something that it's going to loop over or iterate over, and it takes a code that is essentially the loop body or being applied in the loop body. So like um, this example here takes a list of numbers and a predicate that checks whether uh, the number is divisible by two. And because this is filter, it will apply this and uh, only keep uh, the elements for which the predicate passes, so only the even numbers. And theoretically, again, what we want is that somewhere in the enumeration in height three, uh, we, we will take uh, a production for filter and we uh, combine it with input as the list that we're going to be filtering and uh, this code that says the element is even. But there's a problem here. The code that we're trying to build uses uh, 
the element in the loop. And we don't know this in the course of our enumeration. We only know input, which is the only thing the user gave us examples on. Uh, and also our enumeration is really, really values dependent. So how are we going to enumerate something that has E in it? And we can solve this by uh, basically starting an inner synthesis inside of our synthesis and taking our exponential process and turning it into doubly exponential. And so we've solved it by making it so much harder that it's not worth waiting for. But we can actually solve this uh, in the user interaction because we have this uh, feature of Wrestle that says, you can tell the synthesizer to hone in on a little piece uh, and only uh, try to synthesize that and keep the outside as it was. So if we say that the synthesizer is no longer going to introduce loops on its own, the user has to do that because our user is a programmer and they probably know that they're going to need a loop here if they're going to need a loop here. So we ask them to write out what kind of a loop they want and then focus the synthesizer on the inside of the loop and uh, send it off to work just on that. And now that means that the synthesizer uh, needs to handle this new form of specification. Our specification now says the outside of the expression is input.filter. And it now needs to translate this, including the example, into examples for, uh, or at least inputs for the inner variable. And so now our um, enumeration is back to being flat because it works specifically on values of E, specifically when the code outside is input.filter. So, you know, we're back to the cozy single exponent with which we're very, very comfortable. And then just as a last small challenge, uh, we need to look at what happens when we let the user write absolutely anything that they want in the input box to your tool. Um, because really, they can write anything. They can write things that the synthesizer has never seen or heard of before. So even if we put a little fix this box around just this little part, just in this part uh, inside the map, it's entirely possible that the, synthesize, the synthesizer doesn't know F, has never heard of F the synthesizer doesn't know this very specific IP address. Uh, but even more than that, um, it doesn't know that X plus one is important. And because a synthesizer as one of the means of speeding up the search works on a very limited space of possible programs, once we let the user write something that could be outside of that space, we kind of have to figure out how do we handle that? Because if the user tried to write this and then said, fix this, and we go off and we try to do something that doesn't know anything about F or this IP address or that X plus one is important, um, we might be missing a really easy fix for uh, what they wanted. Or we might be coming back with something that's just absolutely not what they need or what they had in mind. Because what, what is important to notice is that the attempted program that the user wrote is a kind of expression of intent. Uh, it expresses something that the user thought might or probably is important. Uh, and we have to address that because right now, until we do, we can't honor that intent. Um, but on the other hand, we can't make the space of possible programs much bigger. We can't say uh, for every F in JavaScript and all of its APIs, we will make sure our synthesizer knows that. 
because our search is going to get really, really slow, really, really quickly. And also we can't treat everything the user typed into the input box as gospel because we're still helping them with code that doesn't work, that doesn't quite do what they wanted. So if we just take it verbatim, it might not help us at all. So what do we do? Well, we very carefully and very uh, locally and dynamically expand the search space. We can learn, quote unquote, um, functions and constants that we didn't know from the user, uh, but for just this one synthesis call. And we can prioritize combinations that the user made like uh, X plus one, or maybe the entire call to F, because maybe all we need to do is wrap it in something and it'll work um, just the way we needed to wrap uh, length divided by two by math four and it was fine. But we're not committing that we're, we're going to use this. We take these things and we add them to the synthesis components that the synthesizer already knows and try all of them. And yes, it's going to be a little bit slower because we made our um, vocabulary of components a little bit bigger, uh, which is why we're only doing this by the absolute minimum bit possible. So the design of Wrestle basically had a lot of back and forth. We started with an interaction idea of these local specifications that we've uh, forced on the synthesizer. The synthesizer was generalized to accommodate them, which then made more specifications available to the interaction, and we added two of them. The synthesizer uh, was too slow when we had loops in there. And so uh, we made a change to the interaction, which in turn required a change from the synthesizer. And the, um, the interaction that lets the user type in anything they want uh, forced us to change the way that we do synthesis. So this back and forth uh, between uh, the synthesizer and the interaction that was just a gradual building up is exactly what co-design is. And it's quite a lengthy process, but it's uh, well worth it because you end up with tools that are, well, a lot more tooly. Uh, the last thing that I'm only going to touch on very, very briefly um, is uh, this tool called Google Plus. Now, Google Plus uh, basically puts synthesis into Google. Google is an API discovery tool, or in other words, a code search tool uh, for Haskell that lets you search by the type of the API function that you're after. And we surveyed some professional Haskell developers, and we found that it's one of the very, very common tools that Haskell developers use in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, you enter a type signature, you get a list of functions um, of that signature out of a bunch of libraries um, that you can pick which one you're searching in. However, this is limited because it's only going to give you results where you, there's a single function that on its own um, is the answer. If you need to combine two, no good. If you have the order of the arguments swapped, also no good. On the other hand, we have a, a synthesis engine that's meant for just these types of uh, type specifications. So again, it seems like it's going to be a pretty natural fit. The Google Plus is an API search for Haskell that utilizes synthesis to make results. Uh, so it can accept type queries just like Google can, but it can also accept usage examples or any combination of the two. And it's gonna return a list of expressions that might be compound expressions where Google is only gonna give you one function at a time. So I'm not gonna go into what we had to do to bring uh, the API search workflow together with this type-based synthesizer. But you can see how this only bears some resemblance to the Google screenshot that I showed you before, where there's just the search box um, 
and a button to click and results and that's it. Um, so that may give you, or may, may hint that there was some co-design going in the background. And then before I conclude, I'm just gonna say about two words about uh, future directions of this kind of research. Um, and just like everything else in this talk, future work uh, takes two concurrent directions, where one is exploring uh, more programming workflows that can be augmented this way, like maybe test-driven development and maybe debugging, and maybe even exploring the benefits of this to programmers of scientific simulations that work in somewhat different workflows and in different programming paradigms. And then the other is exploring more synthesizers that can augment these workflows, more things that we can specify to them, uh, like maybe using partial inputs instead of concrete inputs in an example uh, in an example context but also forms of soft specifications such as maybe using best coding practices or the user's own coding habits over time as what specifies uh, or what helps specify uh, the synthesizer uh, and of course i would be remiss if i don't think uh, everyone who was involved in this research, um, the great people from uh, UCSD and from the Technion. Uh, and uh, thank you all for your time. All right, great. Thanks so much, Hila. I'll give you the virtual applause. Everybody can put clap on the, uh, on the Slack. Um, so we're, uh, we're ready to take questions. So uh, please, if you have a question, you can go ahead and post it on Slack. Um, I will go ahead and start. Um, so uh, that was uh, really cool. Um, I, I would love to play with some of these tools. They seem really neat. Um, so I just have a question about like when things go wrong. Since this is all user interaction and you know it's sort of search um, and it could in principle kind of go off the deep end. Um, how do you cope with that? Is there some sort of feedback loop that you've considered? I mean, I assume that this happens. So you'll tell me if it doesn't yeah. happen, then, okay. Of um, course so, yeah, so, so if this happens, um, is there a way of dealing with this with the user so that the, um, there could be some kind of a loop where the user maybe adds some information or you say, hey, this is really causing the search space to explode. Can you give me some more hints or something? Is that something you've looked at? Is there previous work that covers this? Is that where you're going? Uh, there's some work going on uh, on how to hint why synthesis failed. Uh, a lot of it is not in a tool context, but more um, theoretical slash philosophical. Uh, there's ways that you could do this um you know in in a or there's ways that you could that you would want to do this that require strong ai uh there's ways there's the other things that you could do on the other hand so there's a, a work of mine um that i didn't include here at all that basically says well Maybe the reason I did not find a result is that there's a mistake in the specification, for instance, because, you know, people make typos and examples, people click on the wrong thing, whatever. Can I give you a result that answers three out of four pieces of specification? or you know, the five programs that answer three out of four pieces of specification, maybe one of those is what you wanted. Uh, which happens to um, also sometimes help if just, you know, your problem is too hard. You gave the synthesizer too big of a synthesis chunk, um, but I can solve part of it. I can solve something that, that, you know, just wrap it in one or two more function calls, but I've solved the simple cases already. Um, so, so there's work that does that, for instance. Um, but a lot of that, or what I've found um, 
and, and this is in no way rigorous. This is mostly watching people play with the tools and, and um, trying to figure out what seems to hurt. Um, having the synthesizer come back really quickly. So if it's gonna fail, it should fail fast. And uh, making it really easy um, to try something else again very fast are usually the things that are important. Because the thing that really helps the most is kind of having a good mental model of what the tool can do for you. If you kind of get it, um, if you have a good idea of what the tool can't do, you're not going to waste your time on doing bad things. And then the only thing that we still have to handle is what happens when you've accidentally made a mistake. Okay, cool. So, um, so let's see. So when you say that it fails, uh, just to, to follow up on that, like, does it just come back and say it couldn't come up with anything? Or yeah. can you do something? Can you do something a little more where you're like, well, I can come up with this thing, which works for three of your, ex your example inputs, but not the fourth one. And maybe it turns out, oh, that fourth one, uh, I screwed that one up. Like that would be a great news really for the user. Yeah, so, so there's uh, uh, an eCoop paper um, I think eCoop moved to November, so it will be appearing in November um, of hours that does exactly uh, that. It just, okay, you cool. know, I, I've solved three out of four examples. Is this good enough? Right, great. Okay, I look forward to reading it. Um, so there's a question. Um, does it work to guide the synthesizer towards efficient code, uh, space and or time? Um, and I don't know, I'm not familiar with this particular work, but it says such as to synthesize, e.g., oh, I get it, quick select for the median example. Okay, so as, i.e. using the uh, the fast median finding algorithm. Um, currently, no, but um, this work, um, or the way that we've generalized the search for Russell, um, in theory, can support anything that can be uh, quickly tested. So if we now have uh, some, if we now have a, a way to gauge performance very, very quickly, just looking at the code without just running it and timing it, uh, we can try to get that in there. Can't promise it will work, but we can try. Okay. Uh, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I think it seems like it would be uh, maybe a bridge too far to ask a synthesizer to just come up with um, a gigantic algorithmic advance, um, which I think is where the, uh, the the questioner was going. But um, this is this this notion that somehow you could could come up with, like, could the synthesizer magically discover quicksort, for example? Um, and that seems like that would be um, that's a very high bar to set. It's it's a high bar to set, but I think it's also not really the thing that we would want to, to really utilize synthesis for, um, or at least my vision of synthesis and synthesis in dev tools, it doesn't, you know, come up with the uh, different, more optimal implementation for you. But, you know, if you now need to do something that you would otherwise go to Stack Overflow and spend 10 minutes figuring out what code to copy paste and try to copy paste two things because the first one was actually buggy. Mm -hmm. If synthesis can do that for you in 10 seconds, that's nicer. Yeah, sounds good, I agree. So um, so let's see, so there's another question. Um, in the Russell work in particular, but more generally across your three projects, how did you identify what would be reasonable or acceptable user interactions? So. Um, parenthetically, were there documented programmer workflows that you drew upon or observations that you did? And um, how did you decide that these were the best or the most appropriate interactions? So for instance, in the wrestle workflow, a lot of that was drawing on our own um, dev experience. So um, both my 
uh, PhD advisor and I have quite a bit of time in industry. So it was kind of, um, you know, it, it was quite a selfish thing where we made the tool that we wanted. Mm -hmm. um, at some point where it started getting a little more complex, we did get it in front of some other people who are not us just to see if we're doing something bizarre and we've gone to the we've dug this little hole where we're, we're the only people who get it um in uh in developing google plus for instance um we s surveyed haskell developers like industry haskell developers i think it was either a hundred or a hundred and fifty professional Haskellers who took our survey um, and we asked them questions about, you know, how do they search for code? How do they edit their code? Um, what, you know, what would help them in terms of um, API discovery? Did not phrase it quite that way, but what would help them in terms of API discovery in their day-to-day -day life? Um, and kind of tried to make sure that we're not doing something that completely ignores what a reasonable Haskell developer would want. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, so I, that that's sort of, I mean, the first part I think is a, is a common thing, right? Like uh, we, we're developers, we feel the pain, we try to, uh, to address it ourselves. But yeah, the survey is interesting. So um, talking about Haskell makes me wonder if, um, if you got much feedback on the sort of um, property-based, like quick check style thing that um, that I know is quite popular in that community and is increasingly popular outside. So where you have some sort of a function, uh, this is for fuzz testing, right? So you have a property, uh, you say, oh, I'd like to verify that this code meets this property. Uh, and then it generates a bunch of random examples, uh, which is super cool and can find lots of bugs. Um, again, I'm not naive, I'm somewhat naive in this space, but um, rather than having explicit input output examples, would it be useful to have uh, properties, right? I mean, if code, if coders are happy to write the properties that they anticipate their code is going to have, it seems like that's something that could go into the synthesis process, but maybe this has already been done. Um, in a way, basically what you're, what you're suggesting is let's take a, a way that people are very comfortable with to specify testing and take this test specification that in testing would involve random generation and turn that into a logical specification for synthesis. And uh, I don't know that there's work that does specifically this, but it's, you know, in general, I know that there is a lot of buzz about um, taking things that developers already do um, and incorporating them. So this is kind of one of the things that I talked about in terms of um, taking best practices, for instance, and using them as uh, synthesis specifications, maybe at some point later in the future. So taking uh, things that you do for testing and turning them into synthesis specification and, and property-based testing. Um, you know, I, I'm more familiar with it in the Scala world than I am in the Haskell world personally. Um, and I know it's got some saturation, but not like, like it, it has its hardcore crowd, but it's hardcore crowd is maybe not huge. Um, sure. So yeah. it's worth it's, exploring, but. Yeah, I think it's gotten popular in the, uh, the Python community. There's a, um, a tool called Hypothesis, uh, which is a property-based checker. Um, and so that's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of traction, I would say. Um, so, you know, if you have people, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of like if people move beyond basic sort of JUnit style annotations and have something richer, clearly that's something that you could harvest. And it would be cool if you could just be in a world where you're like, oh, here's some properties of things, and then you can synthesize some, uh, some, some things rather than relying on these examples that you have to then come up with rules uh, inductively from. Cool, all right. So, um, so I have one more question. 
um, and uh, we'll we'll make this the last question. Um, so you've mentioned the integration into the TDD process as a possible continuation. Um, all right, I don't know what this is, so hopefully you do. Although the BDD process seems to be more suitable for your tasks, is the only methodology based on the specification accepted by the programming community. I'm not sure if, for me, BDD means binary decision diagrams, but I guess it must be something I'm, I must say that for me too, but I am <laughs> happy to take this uh, offline with whoever asked. Um, okay, sounds good. So, um, so Hila will be uh, will be available to answer questions on the Slack. Um, and for those of you out there who have not signed up on the Slack and are just watching this on YouTube streaming, um, please uh, please go to systemslunch.org and register, and then we'll add you to the Slack so you can fully participate. Um, and with that, I just want to thank you, Hila, for the uh, the, the great talk, uh, super inspiring. And uh, thanks everybody for for attending. And see you all next time. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much.